Our hosts today are Walter and Stacy Nussbaum. Welcome back. Good afternoon. I'm so excited to be here today. We get to interview Walter. He's always uh, asking all the questions and interviewing everyone else. And so I'm super excited to uh, get to interview you today and let everybody get to know you and what you do and what you're all about. So yeah, I'm excited. Thank you. Well, yeah. if there's anybody that's a great question asker, it's you. So <laughs> when you came up with this idea, I thought, sure, yeah, I'd love to do it's that. It's time. Super yeah. excited to turn the tables. So let's just get started. I want to hear a little bit about you and what you do, Walter, just um, from consulting to authoring, uh, mentoring, leadership training. Just help us have a glimpse of kind of what you do. Yeah. Well, um, as you well know, because you're in my corner all the time, um, I just, I love impact and influence. I mean, those are the two things, whatever forms or mediums that takes. I just love to be in the lives of people. There's something about watching a person's life blossom. And if you can have some semblance of, uh, of um, responsibility for that, it's a wonderful thing. You know, I got a text message from a guy yesterday and it's one of those you just don't delete. And he was just saying how much he's been reflecting on the years of his growth as a person, as a leader. And he said, I just wanted to reach out to you, let you know mm-hmm. that the time you spent with me to this day has made an impact. You know, and those things go a long way. How encouraging. It makes you realize, okay, that's what I'm doing. So whether yeah. it's, you know, as a keynote speaker, whether it's training, whether it's coaching, whether it's writing, doing a podcast, it's all tethered by the same thing. It's about yeah. impact and impacting influence. people. Yeah. So tell us, how did you get into this? You know, um, I guess I could be somewhat personal about it. Yeah, you know, we obviously know the our, the story, but years ago, I was actually I had gone, I finished college, I got my degree in strategic management. Uh, my brother and my dad were always highly business minded, and so I had an interest in business and finished uh, my my strategic management degree, but then ended up kind of going a different direction. I ended up going doing graduate work in, um, in theology, and I, and I went to seminary, and I went into ministry, and I just began doing a lot of counseling and, and, and teaching and leading groups and casting vision and doing all those things ministry-related and really spending my life with people. And uh, I went through a very, very difficult and painful divorce in 2003, and so I, took, uh, I, t- I stepped out of that for a while and had to figure out what I'm going to do. And uh, I was a tennis pro for a number of years, so I, I had to go. I had to make some money. So <laughs> I, I called my old job back and said, "Are there any positions available?" And boy, they were great. They said, "Absolutely." So I went back and started teaching uh, tennis. And there was a gentleman that was a member at the club there, and uh, he was very successful, mm. and he owned a professional uh, sports team. And he asked me one time if I'd be open to coming and speaking to a group of 11 CEOs and presidents and executives. And I'd never done that before. And I said, on what? And uh, he said, you know, I've known you long enough. I just think you would do a great job. And boy, I was very, very nervous to do that. But uh, I did it. I did mm-hmm. it. And that's the beginning of one of my lessons, one of the big mm-hmm. lessons in my life, that uh, fortune falls to the bold. Yeah. It and took I, a lot of courage. It took a lot of courage. Yeah. You were scared. <laughs> I was frightened. Hard to believe, but yes, you were scared. I didn't want to humiliate him. I didn't want to humiliate uh-huh. me. You know, the idea of being in a boardroom with uh-huh. 11 people at that stature uh, and, and boring them to death, mm-hmm. that was frightening to me. Mm-hmm. But I did it. And this is where it changed. When I got, we went a couple hours and somebody raised their hand and said, man, mm-hmm. this has been great. Could we go through lunch? And they all agreed, and they wanted to go longer. And so we went longer. And so when we got done, this gentleman walked me to my car that invited me. And he said, hey, I want to ask you a question. I don't want you to take this the wrong way. He said, what are you doing? He really saw your potential. He did. Mm -hmm. He saw something in me. I mean, to me, I was teaching tennis, trying to figure out what's next in my life. Mm -hmm. He saw something. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, Walter, you just held everybody for three hours, and they didn't want you to stop. He said, you need to do this for a living. Mm -hmm. I said, really? And he said, Walter, you're you're really good at this. And the next week, I just finished reading this book uh, that that week. It was a book by a guy named Dennis Waitley. He wrote that, I think, back in the 80s, and it was called Seeds of Greatness. So (laughs) 
I started. That's a, where you got that idea. That is right. That's okay. right. So I started a company the next week called Seeds of Greatness Incorporated, and I went to Kinkos yeah. back then, yeah. and I made these like really <laughs> cruddy looking business cards. They were glossy, and I had a little tree with seeds on the bottom. And but I was you were a, proud. I was a life advisory consultant. Yeah, that's awesome. And I started I a life it. coaching business, and. You know, it just began to take off. You know, it was God's grace in my life, and people began to call and meet with me, and all of a sudden it grew into corporate coaching. And, Mm -hmm. you know, as they say, the rest of it was history, and Mm -hmm. I've just been very fortunate. I think what's fascinating about that story is that this gentleman that brought you to this meeting met you on the tennis court. So you were kind of a tennis coach, pseudo-therapist counselor to all of your coachees. Yeah. Right? And so he really saw something Something really big in you, or he never would have asked you to do such a thing that was outside of tennis. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's really true. He saw something. You know, it was a running joke at the club. You know, my boss at the club, the director, he'd always say, um, a tennis lesson with Walter is the best deal in town because you get a tennis lesson and a counseling it's session. It's a double whammy. <laughs> all for the same price. And uh, it's so true. true. I just love to listen to yeah. people's stories in their life, and I would just try to provide whatever insight I could to help them. And it's just kind of followed yeah. me all my life. Yeah, tennis was really just a, a stepping stone into what was yeah. ahead for you, which is really neat. Right. right, and for some people, that's a beautiful career, and they do it, and they're great, mm-hmm. and they make an impact, and they build relationships, mm-hmm. and I love that. That yeah. could have been a wonderful career for me. I could have stayed yeah. in tennis and been a director and had the same impact in that, in that right. genre of work, but some other opportunities came my way, and I didn't leave the club for years, even mm-hmm. after I started doing mm-hmm. that, because I just loved the people and my job mm-hmm. so much. I didn't want to leave, but eventually it got so busy, I it just couldn't to. keep booking tennis lessons. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you talked to so many people across the country about so many different topics. So what would you say is kind of at the heart of the message that you're wanting to send out? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I would really say at the heart of it, because this is what my life is. My life, I've said this before, and you you know this because you've known me since I was young. My life was marked by such mediocrity, Stacey, mm-hmm. for so many years early in my life. I mean, I say that with shame. I wish I'd have taken advantage of the earlier years better than I did. Um, but I can say that my life over time through struggle and failure mm-hmm. uh, and hard work mm-hmm. has become more and more marked by the pursuit of excellence. And the idea that you can do it, mm-hmm. I believe that. I believe that when I'm sitting in front of somebody or I'm speaking to a group, I truly believe that everybody there can do it. Because you've lived it. Because I've lived it. Yeah. And if, if you would have seen my grades and my lifestyle and my mm-hmm. habits at 15, 18, mm-hmm. 21, 22 years of age. I mean, I've, we laugh now, but graduating college with a 2.3 GPA. <laughs> that's amazing. That's despicable. And I didn't go it's to Yale. It's hard to believe. It's hard to believe, honestly. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it came from a mentor, somebody who yeah. came into my life yeah. that began to really make me believe that I can do it, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so that really has become my message, that everything mm-hmm. I do truly is about mm-hmm. this is achievable for you, whether it's mm-hmm. professionally financially, relationally, you can do it if you're willing yeah. to do the right things. It's kind of the beauty of your story. I think you you have kind of this quintessential testimony, if you will, mm-hmm. about going from a 2.3 uh, to where you are. And it's just you can actually really tell someone the story, and it has real meaning because you can say, listen, this is where I was you know, and this is where I've come in spite of so many obstacles. And you just have kind of this uncanny, truly uncanny, tenacious spirit to not mm-hmm. give up in spite of yeah. a lot of barriers, which is it's really cool, really admirable. Well, thank you. I, I do thank you. You know, I'll tell you what drives that for me. It's truly the fact that I just want, I want so much more for my life. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that is one of the obstacles that I find in people. One of the obstacles that I find in people that don't break out of mediocrity is that they say they want more, but they're not willing to do what it takes for more. Mm-hmm. And you've got to be willing to do what it takes. Mm-hmm. You know, I know this is about asking me questions, but look, when mm-hmm. I've watched your life, it's honestly one of the things that we've admired about each other. You know, I've watched you do things that you did not want to do, mm-hmm. but because you've always wanted so much more for your life, you were willing to put yourself out there in certain respects 
to allow yourself to see success in things you would never have done unless you made that decision. Yeah. Isn't that true? Sure. Well, we're not flipping it back to me. <laughs> okay. But you have kind of this I can mentality, uh, which I love. You know, I can <laughs> with most things. Yeah. Um, which I think has been a real advantage in your life. So, so this message that you have, it's obviously a very powerful message, and you pretty much share it wherever you go. I've heard you speak countless times, and it's always incredibly inspiring and powerful and real and authentic. Um, what do you think? What do you see as, or what do you identify as the obstacles um, to those that you meet with that are unable to overcome those obstacles, overcome those challenges? Because you face that a lot too. I do. Uh, yeah, I have, and I do see that in other people. And it really is because I think that we are wired towards, being, towards taking the path of least resistance. Mm. All of us are. And our, our biology is wired that way. We are wired to conserve. Mm -hmm. to conserve energy. I, I've got this little illustration. You've probably seen me do this in a training before. I'll have somebody come up to the front of the room and I'll, I'll put a pencil uh, on the ground and it'll be maybe mm -hmm. six inches, eight inches, a foot in front of them. And I'll say, hey, I want you just to jump over this pencil. And you've seen them do this. Mm -hmm. They'll jump. And how far over that pencil will they jump? Just enough to jump over it. Just enough. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. And then I'll say, okay, great job. You jumped over the pencil. Hey, um, I want you this time, come back. I want you to do it again, but I want you to jump as far as you can this time, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I will say, don't hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and so they'll back up and they'll do this big jump and they'll jump mm -hmm. three feet, some, four, five feet, depending on who's doing it. And I'll say, wow, now why didn't you do that the first time? And what answer do I inevitably get when they say, why did, when I say, why didn't you jump that far the first time when I said, jump over the pencil? What, are they, what do you think they say? Because you only asked me to jump over the pencil. That's it. You just asked me to jump over. You didn't say how far. The reality is they just instinctively thought, I'll just jump as far as I need to. Mm -hmm. That's the mentality, right? That's the mentality that human beings have got to get on the other side of. That was my mentality. I did just enough mm -hmm. to try to not get fired, even though I got fired from five jobs. Mm -hmm. I try to do just enough. And you have a great acronym for that. What's it called? Oh, NGFE. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. It's a great model. I talk about that in corporate mm -hmm. America, that we are right now in America, 70% of the average American goes to work every day and operates out of not get fired mm -hmm. energy. Mm -hmm. And it's this exactly. doing just enough. And that's the mentality. So when I get to go and speak at conferences and I get to go speak to organizations and teams and try to help them understand how do you get people to tap into the residual energy that's in them to do the best that they can as opposed to just enough, I tell them, imagine what that could do for your company mm -hmm. if people came to work with that attitude. So that really is it. I think if there is an obstacle that truly keep somebody from doing the things that I talk about, mm -hmm. it's that they don't want to get away from doing just enough. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a crippling mentality mm -hmm. because you will never get the dividends of, of an excellent life by, doing, by living an average life. Very interesting. It makes me think about a podcast we just did about mindset, the, the inward mindset versus the outward mindset with the box model. So it kind of lends itself to that. If you have an outward mindset, then you are going naturally to strive towards making a more, more of an impact, right? And then just doing the bare minimum. That's it. Absolutely. Which is what you're always doing. Yeah, I get up, man. I, just, I get up every day. You laugh in the morning sometimes, <laughs> but I, I wake up every day. Ready to conquer it no matter what time it is. It could be 3 a.m. or 5 a.m. or yeah, 7 a.m. And that's no bragging on me. It's just I, it's because I I've experienced it. the other side. I've experienced mediocrity and, and, and poverty, a poverty yes. mindset. I know what that's like. And to get up every day, I mean, when I'm opening the blinds in the morning and I say, it's another <laughs> morning, beautiful <sweetie>. day. <laughs> You're so consistent. Yeah. The kids laugh, don't they, when I say it's a great day to be excellent. You know, uh, I, I say Don't that say that of, before 8 a.m., please. Yeah, don't say that before 8 a.m. <laughs> I say that kind of tongue in cheek because it's kind of funny, yeah. but you know, I believe it. Yeah, I know you it's do. a great, and I've got so far to go. You know, you are really somebody that challenges me to continue to pursue excellence, but I really do. Mm -hmm. I, I because I see the rewards of it. Yeah, and I get excited about tomorrow. Yeah, and what tomorrow has, and what today has. Yeah, so. and it's contagious. It is. So obviously, you love what you do. I mean, you just you're so passionate about what you do, and traveling, and speaking, and impacting people, and it's it's really great to watch. 
and yet I know it comes with a price. You know, it's it's uh, can be exhausting at times traveling the way that you have, except for during this COVID season. You've had a wonderful reprieve, which I've appreciated. No. Um, but what are, what would you say are some of the most difficult parts about what you do? Yeah, I think it's um, honestly, I love impact. I love influence. But to have to be on mm-hmm. every time. I mean, I think 2019, I did 174 live engagements. You know, to have to be on 174 times and to really give your best, your best focus. And I'm not always on. I try my best. Oh, but okay. that um, that's one of the biggest challenges is because every person, you know, it's, I used, I used to, uh, I had a, uh, a, fr- a friend of mine tell me who was a tennis pro back when I taught tennis. He said to me something that changed the way I taught tennis lessons. He said to me, Walter, what might be your sixth or seventh tennis lesson that day is a student's hour that they couldn't wait for all day. Mm-hmm. That, is, that is their one hour today they're excited about. And you have the opportunity to make that hour the best hour of That's their day, nice. if not the best yeah. hour of their week. I remember thinking about that, and I I thought, wow, this is the hour all day they've been waiting for their 2 o'clock lesson. And it really impacted me. And Mm -hmm. that's how I feel now when I do coaching or training or speaking. Mm -hmm. It's like that hour potentially could be the best hour of their day, and I get to be a participant (laughs) in helping to craft that. Right. It's a pretty awesome yeah, uh, it responsibility. Yeah, it is. It is. So, yeah, that's, a, that's one of the big obstacles for me is just being able to, to, to be fully present and fully ready. Yeah. I'd say the other thing is to do what I'm doing as many years as I've done it, I've been fortunate. I've been fortunate to be able to sustain this business uh, for, for all these years. You have to always be fresh. Mm-hmm. You know, you cannot fish out of a stagnant pond, yeah. right, because eventually the fish stink. Right? you got to be a river. Which is why you're always studying and learning and reading and just taking in information. Always. I have to. Yeah. Right? I've got to be fresh. If I, you know, I've been fortunate. My average that I'll have a client, if I'll go in and do coaching or training, my average is about four years I'll keep a client. Mm-hmm. You know, for four years. You just keep coming up with information that they've never heard. Well, that's it. It's because it's like, hey, what else do you have? Yeah. Right? And, I, and I can honestly say I lo- everything that I study and read, I want to pour it out into other people. Yeah. And so I'm able then to go and not just give one presentation or, you know, I've got 10 modules and that's all I got, yeah. right? I've got enough information that I want to be able to have a multi-year engagement with people if they're able to do that, mm-hmm. because I've got so much great con- uh, content and information that can really impact people. Mm-hmm. So you're kind of like the Energizer Bunny from my perspective. You really are. You, you are one of the most consistent human beings that I've ever encountered when it comes to just routine and attitude and enthusiasm. Um, and you love what you do, which obviously helps. Um, but you truly do kind of have this, um, this uh, real positive, positive bent about you. And I think it makes it a little bit easier for you to do some of the things that you're talking about. So mm-hmm. what would you say to the person that, that struggles a little bit with that positive bent and doesn't have kind of that energy or that, that confidence or that ability to, Go out there and you know, yeah. live the Arate, uh, you know, way every right. day. What would you say to them? I really believe this. I believe it's all in how you talk to yourself. I really do believe that. I think that you know, I've been through hard times, and you know, some of the things I've been through in my mm-hmm. life. And as hard as they were, and as dark as they, some of them were in my life, I still was able to say to myself, "You're going to get through this. Mm-hmm. It's going to be okay." Great days are ahead. You know, just just continue to plod every day. Make the right decisions every day moving forward. I believe that. Mm-hmm. And I would tell myself that. And the way a person talks to themselves will impact eventually the way they see everything around them. Mm-hmm. It's a discipline to it where is. it becomes reflexive. Mm-hmm. You become reflexively positive. I don't mean reflexively idealistic, where you're kind of in la-la land, not really being real. I mean positive. To me, an optimistic person is a person <laughs> who sees things the way they really are, but not worse than they are. Mm-hmm. Right? That's good. And, and, and because of that, I'm able then to also see how it can still become. And so I don't stick my head in the sand to, to the realities of what's going on in my life. 
But I, that doesn't mean I don't still see that it's going to be better. Yeah, you do. Yeah. You do. So that's it. I, I really do try to continually speak positive things in my life. You're reading a book right now that's kind of it lends itself to this, yeah. right? What is the, what is the book? You are the placebo. You are the placebo yeah. by it's fascinating. Uh, Joe Dispenza. Right. And, and really, right even though life. I know you're talking to me here, but what's the gist of the book as far as you go? What's he talking about in that book? What is he trying to say? Just the power of the mindset, you know, the mind-body connection, the power of the mindset over your attitude, how it, you know, it really transforms it. It's you are what you tell yourself you are. That's right. In many ways. And, that, and it translates into disease process and, you know, in every aspect of right. a person's well-being. Um, but there's studies that really show, you know, the, the power of the placebo effect. And, uh, and, you know, it's really been enlightening to me. It's really made me think about things differently regarding myself, yeah. regarding my son. You've even said sometimes, oh, I, I need to not think this way or talk mm-hmm. this way so mm-hmm. much, mm-hmm. right? And you've caught yourself sometimes. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that you're going to be on this kind of <laughs> perpetual high. But, you know, our bodies are <sighs> this amazing chemical-producing machine. Yeah. And what you think and how you think releases different chemicals. And so for me, by being so optimistic, it releases these chemicals that energize me. And I truly get up every day and I'm ready. I'm ready for the day. I'm ready to, and I've got my routine. I get up in the morning. I start off with my coffee. I've got, I I get into my study. I Mm -hmm. do my reading. I do my devotional Right, I spend my time, I try to do my prayer time, and then I get into my day. Mm-hmm. And now I, I, I tackle my responsibilities. Yeah. It makes me think about, too, just your rituals that you used to go through with tennis and mm-hmm. sports that you would do. Yes. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, it was called, uh, my old coach called it a ritual of thought. Yeah, and it worked. It worked, It was yeah. very effective. Every night yeah. he would have me go to bed at night yeah. and think in my head about different strokes in tennis. Watch yourself yeah. hitting volleys and forehands and serves and playing a match. And he would tell me that what you're thinking in your brain, your mind doesn't differentiate between the thought and the reality. Mm-hmm. And if you begin doing that, mm-hmm. when you get on the court, mm-hmm. your body will begin to act as if you thought, the yeah. way that you thought. Yeah. And I began to incorporate that later on in my life, in my speaking. And you know this, when I have a big keynote coming up. Yeah, you lay in bed and you go over it. And every night for about a week before, so I give forth. the whole talk in my head laying in yeah. bed as I'm falling asleep. And I see myself on the stage, and I watch, and I see people, and I watch my opening, and I yeah. watch to as much detail as possible. Yeah. And by the time I get there, I'm relaxed, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm jazzed, and I'm ready to go. Mm-hmm. Love it. Yeah. I tried this on the golf course yesterday, though, and it didn't work. <laughs> I kept telling myself I'm going to hit a good shot, and it kept going off to the <laughs> That right. is such false humility. <laughs> you hadn't hit a ball in a year, and you shot a 51 and a 51. Anyway, I did try playing. it, and it didn't work. But I will uh, tell a funny story without going into the full detail of it, but we were going to play golf yesterday, and we were trying to find the golf you know, place to get our, our, our golf cart. Yeah. And we had all our clubs and everything. I don't even know what I was doing, but I was complaining. Complaint after complaint. I was trying to find my shoes and my glasses, and we had all our stuff all over, the, all over the sidewalk. And and you finally said to me, "Stacy, shut up." <laughs> <laughs> and normally I would take offense to that. I might even really get mad at you and go in the box. Yeah. But we both just belted out laughing because in that moment I realized One, I never said that. I never talked. Like no, that you don't. You. You're you never talked to me like that. Yeah. So it was kind of shocking. <laughs> but it was the funniest thing because it really hit me like I. I do need to shut up. I mean, I just was. <laughs> yeah. Well, in my mind, it's like, wow, we're about to play golf together. Nick <laughs> is with us. It's this beautiful day. It's this beautiful course. And I'm watching, I'm watching my beautiful wife complaining right there. I'm like, Stacey, shut it's up. It's hot. Why am I even here? I need some water. Yeah. yeah. But that self-talk, it's true. I mean, you know, people yeah. might hear about that and read about that and, and kind of poo-poo on it. They have yeah. no idea the power that happens from that. Yeah. I'm not one of these people, and I may lose an audience here. You know, there's this big thing out there about, you know, speaking into existence. You can attract whatever you want by what you... I, I don't yeah. believe that. Yeah. I think that how you think will attract you to certain people because you think the same, or you might, you know, sure. run across a book that you've been looking for because your mind is aware of a topic that you're interested in. So, right, in that sense, 
there's a you find and see things that way. Right. I don't think you create a reality. You but that's a, that's a little bit different than the placebo. You are the placebo, don't you think? Yes. The whole totally. philosophy there. It's a little mm-hmm. bit different than that. I do, believe and I that. do believe in that. But I think it's taken that book for me to read that book to really understand the power of that. Yeah. I've heard it forever, but really reading that book, I would recommend. Yeah. It. I had a uh, funny story. I had a. Uh, uh, it's been long enough that I can say this, but I had a client once that I met with her for a coaching session, and she was really down like very sad. And I went in there and I said, I said, you doing okay? She goes, I'm not doing okay. I said, what's going on? She said, Walter, I've been doing this ritual um, every day. I, I read this book and I've been doing this ritual um, for my finances and it's not working. And I said, well, what's the ritual? And she said, well, I wake up every morning and I start off with this mantra and I tell myself, I'm wealthy beyond comparison. I have so much money in my account. My, my account is filled with money. My account is filled with... And she said, I do this mantra every day. And she goes, I've been doing that for years, and I'm broke. Sorry. I'm about to lose my ranch. And she, she would check her account, she said, to see if there was just some check out of nowhere that just showed mm-hmm. up in her account mm-hmm. because she believed that if she thought it, she could create it. Mm-hmm. And I said to her, that will never happen you're going to have to figure out a second job. You're going to have to figure something out, start cutting back on expenses. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to figure out how to do the work to get the money that you need to get. It's not right. going to just materialize. And I know some people right now are probably saying, that's not true, that's not true. I don't believe it. I believe you create your own reality. Mm-hmm. And what you think about, you'll find yourself attracted to. Right. And yeah. there's a difference between that and saying to yourself, I am capable, or I am a child of God, or I am forgiven, or I am loved. I think that's different. Yeah. Right? I totally agree. I we, totally we agree. We believe in that, mm-hmm. for sure. Yep. So, okay. Well, how exciting that you got to tell us your story I and know. all that you do. I love hearing about that and just so proud of you and just where you've come. And I know that this COVID has presented a little bit of a challenge, but in some ways it's been a gift because it's allowed you to kind of do some new things and do a yeah. podcast. and Yeah. You know, that's the gift here. The gift here is that for these six months, you and I have got have had this chance to do a podcast together. And uh, to me, it's honestly, I could probably say in my entire career, I look forward to this time together probably more than anything else I do because mm-hmm. I get to do it with you for one, but also because I think that you've lived the life that I admire also, mm-hmm. a life uh, filled with ups and downs right? Hardships and successes in your life. And I admire that. And you live the life with the mindset that I also admire and appreciate. How are you putting this back on me already again? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, it's true, but I'm just saying that because during COVID, this podcast has been yeah. a wonderful opportunity. We found this awesome guy, you know, Michael Moffitt, yes, right? Check him out. He's, been, he's amazing. Um, You're right. It's been a real silver lining. It's been a great silver lining. And just again, look. And having you around. The, yes. Uh, it has been great to be home every day. Um, but to be able to put in content out there for people that mm. just to help them and to put it on YouTube and Spotify and Apple iTunes and all that and have people be yeah. able to, to listen to the podcast and listen to the clips. And then you get these great feedback comments about, man, thank you so much and really enjoy that. And that really helps me so much. Yeah. That yeah. is fulfilling, right? That is the legacy that we believe in yeah. is to provide that kind of information for people. So that's what yeah. drives me. So I can't Amen. thank this individual enough, some 15 years ago, who mm-hmm. saw something in me and challenged me to go down this road, because mm-hmm. I wonder sometimes yeah. if that never happened, or if he never would have walked me to my yeah. car and yeah. said what he said, would what you would have? I be doing right now? Yeah, it really makes you realize the, the, um, the real power of words that you kind of share with someone to encourage or to spur them on to something, just how we have such an opportunity to influence and we don't always take advantage of it, but just that's a great opportunity that he took to propel you into something yeah. that you might not have done otherwise. Right. That's one of my lessons I teach too, is the is what you just said. It's this power of words mm-hmm. to encourage mm-hmm. somebody, to get them to do something maybe they never would have done, to believe mm-hmm. in themselves. Mm-hmm. And when somebody meets somebody that can do that for them, they remember you, mm-hmm. right? They remember the gift you've given them. Mm-hmm. And for me, that gift of helping someone believe in themselves, are there many gifts more important than that, this side of heaven? No. No, no. because self-doubt, self-rejection, self-condemnation, all of those things are the most crippling and stifling things in life. Yeah. 
And that's what keeps people from ever really seeing their dreams. Yeah. The smallest thing can make such a difference. I'll I'll end with this. Um, I was working, I guess it was last week, a couple weeks ago, and it was just one of those really rough days. And I was feeling pretty discouraged. Mm -hmm. And um, one of my coworkers just looked over to me and said, you're doing an amazing job. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I looked at her like, are you talking to me? (laughs) Are you kidding me? This is the worst thing I've had maybe ever (laughs) at work. But, you know, it really lifted me, and it kind of empowered me. And I thought, that was so, that was so sweet of her to say that. I mean, yeah. it's not really true, but, but you know, I really appreciate it. And it kind of gave me that second win to get through the rest of the day. And it's just that taught me so much about how I don't do that enough, you know, but I yeah. want to be that person. Right. I really think how many up. people could do that for people yeah. every day. And you're so good at that. So. Well, you're awesome. You're the best. All right. Well, thank you for thank taking you for the time, time to kind of dig in a little bit about yeah. my past and how super, I got into what fun. I'm doing today. Hopefully it encourages people that they can do it if they set their mind to it. Yes, they can. Thank you, Walter.